Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Close Up. This week on Close Up, what else? Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. Our first guest is Yehuda Avner, former ambassador to the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Australia, and the author of the just published The Prime Ministers, a look back at his career and personal reminiscences working closely with four of Israel's Prime Ministers. Ambassador Avner, welcome to Close Up. Thank you. I understand the book is doing quite well, number two on Stemetsky's bestseller list. That's how I hear. Was all told. To you, may, you may get to number one. Uh, you, let's talk about, you talk, uh, tell a great story in the book about Yom Yerushalayim, how the day started in the morning with Menachem Begin, who was then head of the opposition, but had joined the co unity government, uh, had woken up at four in the morning and heard the radio, and mm. then started the, the process rolling. What was the story? Well, not quite started at four o'clock in the morning. It started uh, the, f the previous morning when um, he got the news that uh, we had to totally destroy the Egyptian air forces and in the process of destroying the other enemy air forces. And this after three weeks of uh, a, a terrifying uh, uh, sense of isolation. Uh, and pending doom. And pending doom. I mean, this was uh, literally a, a sense of this, another Holocaust is about to happen. And uh, suddenly, wallop, boom, bang, we took the enemy air forces by surprise and uh, uh, Begin, yes, he's now a member of, of the government and this is taking place now in the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Eshkel's office in Tel Aviv and they drink a l'chaim and then Begin goes into a corner with uh, Yigal Alon who was then defense minister and Eshkel uh, espies them and he asks them, what are you two up to? And Begin says, we want the old city of Jerusalem, upon which Eshkel says, Das is a good dunk. That is a good idea. They then went up to Yerushalayim, and there was a meeting in the cabinet room in the Knesset. That night? That late afternoon. And uh, uh, as Begin is about to put forward the case of why we have to go to Ju capture Jerusalem immediately, quickly, before the United Nations issues orders a ceasefire uh, as he's in the process of doing that suddenly the sergeant of arms of the Knesset he comes dashing in and says a chutza, a chutza, out, out they're shelling the Knesset and so all the cabinet descended into the lower basement and the only space that was available was a cleaning closet and in that cleaning closet there were brooms and mops and and, and some old chairs, and believe it or not, it was there that the principal decision was taken to take the old city. And I've proposed, officially proposed, that a little plaque... Plaque we put on this, on this that, closet. That, yes. Now, uh, it, the, the, no final decision was taken because Diane, the defense minister, was not there. And Begin and, and, and Eshkol explained that Diane was against taking the old city confrontingly, but to surround it, and it will, in time, it, it will surrender. But uh, Alond said if we don't have Jewish feet on the Temple Mount, it will not be ours. And Begin said this is a historic opportunity and that we must not make the same mistake that we had made 19 years earlier when we had lost the old city with all its shrines and its treasures of the Jewish people. A decision was then taken, a decision was then taken to uh, wait for Diane to, to, to come, come to Zoom. And Begin went home and he couldn't, he went to the hotel, he couldn't sleep. And at four o'clock in the morning, he switched on the BBC. To him in those days, the BBC was the gold standard of, of broadcasting, not today. And he heard that the Security Council was about to pass a ceasefire resolution. He woke up uh, Eshkol. Eshkol told him to speak directly to Dayan. It was agreed the cabinet would meet immediately. The cabinet met immediately at 7 o'clock that morning, and the decision was taken to order Motogor, who was then the commander of the Parachute Brigade, to move in, and within a matter of hours came what is now a historic announcement from General Gore, Har Habayit Biyadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Was it a unanimous vote? It was a unanimous vote. There were some reservations 
Uh, there was a reservation about what the Vatican would say. As a matter of fact, the Vatican had already requested that Jerusalem be declared an open city and that there had been some American support for that. There was a question of what the Soviet Union would do. There was a question of, of what is the Christian world going to do generally if we damage Christian holy places, not to speak of the Muslim holy places. So this was all part of this very somewhat confusing and, and uh, uh, at times a contradictory debate that was taking place within the confusion of a vastly unfolding, speedy scenario of a war that we, 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 was, was forced upon us, that we had preemptively won in the first few hours by destroying the Air Force. But uh, the very fact that there was no contingency plan and the IDF for the possible taking of the old city simply did not exist shows how we were taken by surprise in the NASA build-up to de destroy us in 67. What made, what made Diane change his mind? What made Diane change his mind? The pressure of the room. Uh, it was, number one, the fact that they, the, 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 cabinet, the cabinet was. And number two, uh, Diane uh, was himself. A, a, his initial reservation was purely a, a, a military one, and that is he feared casualties in house-to-house fi -house fighting. But in the end, the Legion, the Arab Legion forces, they were simply uh, were, were, were so smashed that they were in, in retreat. All that were left were the snipers when our forces moved in. I want to show you uh, something that I, I brought along today. Uh, this is the actual front page of the Jerusalem Post the day after uh, the, the uh, liberation of Jerusalem. And um, to show how fast things were moving in the, in, in, during the war, that they put uh, the headline, Old City, Most of Sinai Fall, Tirai Open. <laughs> in other words, there was so much going on yeah, all exactly. over the place, they couldn't figure out what to put the main yeah, story, because exactly. all of it was major and all that was happening at the same time. That, that captures the atmosphere very well indeed. I, uh, a, qu a sentence I wanted to read from you to you, um, uh, that in the editorial of the Jerusalem Post, they write, and this is my only political moment uh, in this, uh, to make Jerusalem secure for the future, the, Israeli for the Israel forces occupied Ramallah, Jenin, and Nablus, and stretched down as far as Jericho on the Dead Sea. So they were thinking of making Jerusalem secure and <laughs> capturing Ramallah, Jenin, and Nablus, and here we are today. But I don't want to go into politics uh, uh, specifically about today's politics. Um, how much pressure was there on the cabinet, on the government, to, uh, uh, to cease fire? Oh, the pressure was enormous. The uh, Wednesday was the capture of the old city. Uh, Security Council was in intense deliberation, or almost around the clock. Uh, uh, by Thursday, a ceasefire uh, is uh, already uh, resolution is already uh, uh, on the table. And this was when enormous pressure now began from the kibbutzim and the moshevim, the villages in the north upon Eshkol, to immediately seize the Golan Heights. And uh, again, uh, Dayan was looking at this from a military point of view. Again, the question of the casualties. But the pressure was such that uh, the, he gave, as defense minister, he gave the order to Yitzhak Rabin, who was the chief of staff, to uh, move forces north and uh, to take the Golan Heights under all circumstances. The casualties were fairly high, but uh, it was able to say, Ramata Golan Biyadenu, the Golan Heights. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, the casualties, of course, they were expecting a lot more. They were preparing yes. huge plots of ground for burial spaces. I was wondering, how much a percentage was the, during the deliberations on what to do? Was it political versus militarily strategic? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I can't make that equation. Uh, you talk about the casualties. Uh, I, a few days before the war began, uh, I had to go down to brief journalists at the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv. And uh, the park leading up to the Hilton, um, I could see uh, Haredi Jews from the Hever Kedisha of Jerusalem. And the, one of the, the driver I recognized um, and uh, I asked him what's going on as these uh, rabbis, Haredi Jews, they were pacing the park. They were reciting all kinds of psukim, biblical verses as they were doing so. I said, what's going on? 
and he said that uh, we are consecrating the park as a cemetery. As a cemetery? What are you talking about? He said, yes, we've been given instructions that all par parks around the country be consecrated as cemeteries because expected 30 to 40 to 50,000 casualties. Uh, and and uh, I, in, in, in that state of mind, I walked into the Hilton Hotel and I, there were these 15 or 20 journalists waiting for me to give a briefing. And the very first question was, why do you look so pale? Why are you sweating? So I had to say, I'm pretty new to the job. and <laughs> I'm rather nervous. All right, on the issue, actually, of the build-up to the war, we'll take a break now and listen to the story of one Jerusalemite, Jerusalemite, I'll get that right, a former New Yorker who made Aliyah in 1956 and was living here in Jerusalem during the Six-Day War. Let's hear now from Nobel Prize winner Professor Yisrael Uman on what the atmosphere was like in the days leading up to the war. It was an extremely tense time. I have to tell you the truth. I, uh, I was not sure that, uh, the, uh, that Israel would survive this episode. Uh, and uh, more, moreover, I wasn't sure that I personally would survive this episode with my own life and the life of my uh, wife and children. Yeah. It looked as if Israel might well be destroyed, not in a year or in 10 years or in 50 years, but in two weeks, yes, okay? It, Israel might be overrun by uh, Egyptian and other Arab forces and um, it looked very, very scary. I mean, I was simply said to myself, Johnny, that's my nickname, don't make the mistake your father made staying in, in Germany too long. Uh, pick yourself up. You have American papers. Your whole family has American papers. Pick yourself up, get on a plane, and get out of here. Get out of here before it's too late. Yeah. Um, and then I said to myself, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm staying. Okay, I'm staying. Um, but it was really touch and go. So why did you decide to stay? Why did I decide to stay? Because this is Jerusalem. This is something that I've been dreaming for for thousands of years now. It, it may look as if I'm really thousands of years old personally with this long white beard, but it's not, that's not the case. I'm only about 80. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I, I identify with the yearning of my people for uh, Jerusalem for thousands of years and having just returned um, about 10 years earlier, I wasn't going to leave. And this is not, this, I said to myself, well, come what may, I am not going to leave. I am staying. What decided the war was the airstrike uh, at the beginning of the war. And uh, if those, if the Egyptians had not been as foolish as to leave their airplanes on the ground at that time, if they would have put their airplanes in the air, then we, it could have turned out different, mm -hmm. and, and I might mm -hmm. not be sitting here talking to you today. You might not even be able to visit my grave. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I, this, this sounds dramatic, but that is God's honest truth. So on the second day of the war, the old city, Jerusalem, is liberated. We hear on the radio, Harabai Biadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. The news floats through the whole country, through Jerusalem. It's been liberated. What were you feeling then? I was walking here near what is now the Sheraton Hotel, you know, down that area near the, um, uh, near Yamin Moshe. I was walking there, and I don't think it was the second day of the war. I think it was the third or fourth day. I don't remember. Exactly. I don't think it was the second day. Um, and uh, uh, I was walking there, and, you know, the, there was shelling going on, and I was looking at the old city, and suddenly from the 
um, from the south western corner of the old city where the Zion Gate is, yeah, I saw the Israeli flag flying. I have to tell you, uh, you know, just thinking of it now makes me um, all prickly all over. I mean, this was this was a, a, a tremendous feeling. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's not it, for me. It's not news report. I mean, I I experienced this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, Ambassador Avner, if I can ask you not a political question, but a personal question, I imagine you can relate to what Professor Uman was saying about the fear that everyone in the country was feeling. Everyone in the country, including the leadership of the country. Uh, I, uh, Navy Eshkol, the Prime Minister, uh, in one of the days preceding the war, uh, he gets information that the Egyptians have introduced gas units into Sinai. And uh, his military secretary comes in uh, with the news and then tells him we have no gas masks in the country. And uh, uh, Eshkel uh, says in Yiddish, blood went gießen wie Wasser. Blood is going to flow like water. And then he gives instructions to his secretary to pick up the phone immediately to Abi Iban, who was in Washington, who was about to be meeting with President Johnson. And uh, uh, he wanted Iban to know the situation, to report to Johnson. And uh, he, he in, in telling him the information about the gas and that we've no gas mass, uh, he, he yells into the phone, Amen, Mahabn Sutim Mitchayas, we're dealing here with animals. Tell that to the Goy, Zuk to the Goy. Uh, he actually had these Yiddishisms, which uh, then there was a case of Rabin, Rabin, who on the eve of the war, uh, some said he'd had a nervous breakdown. Uh, some say he panicked. Some say he panicked. Uh, the fact is that uh, Rabin, as, as chief of staff, had also been serving in a kind of uh, role of Minister of Defense as well, because Eshkol who was Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, he needed Rabin at his side, and he played a very important role in that respect, in preparing the army to do what it eventually did. Um, but uh, I, I spoke to Rabin about what happened. Um, and uh, he looked me straight in the eye, and he, he told me uh, it wasn't really a collapse. I was, I was fatigued almost to the point of collapse. Well, I imagine you must have been up for hours and hours for weeks on end. Days and nights. And uh, I've been smoking, non-stop chain smoking, and uh, I had nicotine poisoning. And uh, at the end of the day, I was within a matter of 24 hours back at my post, which is proof positive. I didn't have a nervous breakdown. Uh, but uh, this was uh, an atmosphere, what we hear Professor Oman say, uh, I can relate it to my own family, my own children, my own friends. The, uh, uh, we had no idea that we were capable of the strength that we eventually brought into the field in which we destroyed the largest, the powerful, the most influential, the most important of all the Arab armies, Egypt, and then went on, had, had, had uh, uh, the King Hussein of Jordan not joined the war, and Esco warned him, don't attack. He warned him both through the United Nations and through the Americans, don't attack. But the answer he got was the shelling of Jerusalem. In your opinion, had he not shelled Jerusalem, would Israel not have gone into the old city? It's more than an opinion. It's a, uh, I, I believe that had he kept out of the war, then uh, we would have remained in the 67 line along the Jordanian front. Uh, and, and, and history would have been completely different. Uh, history would indeed be so. I, I, uh, I think uh, we have to speak here of destiny. Some would call it providence. Uh, we uh, would not be going to the Kotel to the wall this afternoon, this evening, on Yom Yerushalayim, had uh, he not done what he had done. Talk for a minute about the post-war euphoria, uh, the sense of providence, the sense of we, are, we have just lived through 
an absolute miracle nikuda period. It was an absolute miracle. And, well, some, and someone else must have helped along the way. Here, I have to tell you, I wasn't there to see it. Because on the very day that the old city was liberated and the Kotel uh, was in our hands, that very day I received immediate instructions to leave for New York to the United Nations were, and to assist uh, Abbe Iban, who was then fighting the good fight in the Security Council. Uh, and uh, uh, I told my superiors that I'm not going until I've seen the, the Kotel, the wall, which that morning had been, had been liberated. I happened, when I say that I wasn't going until, I, I had this need to see it before I went. And uh, I had a friend who was the, in charge of the military spokesmanship here in Jerusalem. I called him up. He said he would also like to go, so he picked me up in his army jeep, and off we went, and as we approached Lion's Gate, we saw these hundreds of soldiers running, 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 and we ran, ran, ran with them, and uh, in the confusion and the pushing and the shoving and the, and, and, and the, the chauffeur blowing and, and the Yerushalayim shall the half singing, uh, Jerusalem of gold, uh, there I was, uh, but I didn't really see the wall itself. I only managed to see above the heads of the soldiers the upper part. That you were in that, that narrow alleyway that existed until the war. Well, I was on one of the steps. I couldn't get into the alley. I was one of the steps. So I could just see the top. But from there, I was taken straight to Ben Gurion Airport. And uh, 12 hours later, I was in the United Nations uh, receiving dictation. The, the speeches that Ibn was dictating to me, and uh, which are re remark a remarkable feat uh, of, uh, of, of diplomacy and uh, literature as well, as only Abbe Ibn knew how. Yes, correct. All right, um, that's all the time we have for close up this week. We'd love to hear what you think. Do write us at ibatvnews at gmail.com. I'd like to thank our guest today, Nobel Prize winner Professor Yusuf Luman, who turns 80 in four weeks. And in the studio, Yehuda Avner, author of the best-selling The Prime Ministers. And for our listeners in Renana, Ambassador Avner will be speaking at Beit Knesset O'el Ari this coming Sunday night at 8.15. We'd also like to thank our producers, Iran Miller, Carmel, and Dennis Zinn. And thank you for watching. Until next Wednesday at the same time, Yom Yushalayim Sameach. Enjoy the rest of Jerusalem Day and Shalom from Jerusalem.